Hopefully your text is still open to Numbers, the 15th chapter. Numbers 15. Did you have a chance? Were you able to focus on the reading? It was very well done. But it brings up a point that is at the heart of our lesson this morning. The Law of Moses made a distinction between unintentional sin and premeditated sin. In fact, you may have noticed in the text that an unintentional sin, even God refers to it as a mistake. But premeditated sin is very very different. Premeditated sin is you know what God's Word says and you do it anyway. Did you notice in the text that a sacrifice could be made for an unintentional sin, a mistake? You may have unintentionally sinned because you didn't know the law. Or you just forgot. Or it was you were upset. You did something you should not have done, but you never set out in your heart to deliberately disobey God. What awaits the premeditated sinner? Death awaits the premeditated sinner. Meditated sinner. Did you notice that God made no prescription for the forgiveness of high handed, rebellious sin? Well, Byron, you might be stretching that a bit. Now, Numbers has a unique way of stating a law and then giving you an example of what God meant. For example, look at the next set of verses. In Numbers 15, 32 through 36. While the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in custody because it had not been made clear what should be done to him. And the Lord said to Moses, The man shall be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones as the Lord commanded Moses. I want you to think about this. This is the Exodus generation. They sat at the foot of Mount Sinai. They saw the darkness, the clouds, the fire. They heard the trumpet blast. And they heard the very words of God. God spoke the Ten Commandments directly to them. It was after that that they begged that Moses do mediation for them. It was not possible for a person in that generation to not know that God said, on the Sabbath day you shall rest, you shall do no ordinary work. It was on the seventh day God rested from His work, and even though he He has given this to you because you were slaves and you never had a day of rest, The day shall be holy to you. Last week we talked about being holy, as God is holy. And when this man gathered sticks on the Sabbath day, it doesn't matter what the reason is, he went directly against what God had said, and he knew it. No sacrifice was offered for him. He was simply stoned and put to death. God does not want His people to sin. Notice the next set of verses. 
in Numbers 15, verses 39 through 41. Well, actually, we'll begin in verse 37. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Last week when we read from Leviticus, God said the same thing. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So what he tells us is what is for our good. And he instructed the Jewish people who still, when they practice Judaism to this day, wear a prayer shawl with blue tassels on it. And what are the tassels there for? The tassels are to remind them of the commandments of the Lord so that a person like the person who gathered these sticks would not defiantly disobey the Lord, nor would someone by mistake forget the commands of the Lord. I believe that James may have had something like this in mind when he wrote a passage that I believe we are familiar with, but we don't talk about very much. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. I want you to keep something in mind. John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. James is teaching us something. He is telling us that sin does not originate or begin with God. Did you notice verse 13? Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. This is important, because God is holy. The psalmist said in Psalm 77, verses 11 through 13, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Why? Because your way, O oh God, is holy. Notice what the psalmist asks, asks next. What God is great like our God? Sometimes we have a hard time grasping these concepts because we don't think like these people thought. One of the things the people of that day believed was that pagan gods were just like us. 
that they were vengeful, they were tempted to do evil things. And what the psalmist is saying, that God is not like those gods. God is not in any way evil. He is not tempted to do evil. In fact, God has God cannot even be tempted to do the evil and the profane. It, it's not even a temptation for him. Why is that? In Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9, we read, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I want you to think about that for a minute. When someone talked about Baal or Molech, what they thought was that those pagan gods were just waiting to inflict evil and vengeance upon the people and that they had to do sacrifices to appease the wrath of their God. God says, no. I want the wicked to turn from his way. I want him to forsake it. And I want the unrighteous man to give up his thoughts and return to the Lord. Remember, the psalmist says, God is not like the gods around them, where they thought their gods thought like they did. But notice what God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see that. God is not vengeful. God, he, we would be vengeful, but he is not. He seeks to forgive. God seeks to pardon and make us holy. God does not even seek our harm, but our repentance. The prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 18, beginning in verse 30, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord. Certainly he will judge us. Certainly he will punish sin. But he says, Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. God knows what is coming to those who do not repent. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. I want you to think about something. We read in Numbers what God wants done with those who intentionally sin. But now He is speaking to the generation in exile who has intentionally sinned. Who was rebellious to Him. Ezekiel is abundantly clear that the, those exiles were rebellious. But why were they there? Because God has no pleasure in their death. He is giving them the opportunity to turn and to live. At times, I think we wonder why God is the way He is and why He created us to be like Him. But God did create us in His image and gave us the freedom to choose. Therefore, God sent His warning via the Holy Spirit through James, and He is warning His new covenant people against premeditated sin. 
Sin does not begin with God, but it does begin with me. In verse 14, James says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I don't know how clear that picture is to you, but what that is is a large mouth bass about to bite on a lure. The bass wants to eat. He sees something that he loves to eat, and he bites on it. And James says you should take a lesson from the fish. Sin begins with what I lust after or what I desire. Pretty simple. What Bill Stoll may be tempted by, I might not be tempted by. And what I'm tempted by, Bill Stoll might not be tempted by. We're all tempted by something we desire. And sin is personified and shown to be like Satan. He, it works through the desires in my heart that are contrary to God's commands. Is it any wonder that God says He wants to give us a new heart and a new spirit? And when we have these desires, it works to undermine our confidence in God. That's what happened with Eve in the garden. That's what happens to me. Sin uses a lure. He knows what I want, and he puts it on the hook. That hook is covered. I don't see it. But when I bite on it, I know it. You see, it's only a lure if it promises pleasure. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in verse 24, it says that by faith, Moses, and I love this phrase, when he was grown up, Acts 7 tells us that was 40 years old. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Maybe 40 is when we're grown up because that's when we actually begin to understand that the pleasures of sin are fleeting. Most things in this life that give us joy or happiness are fleeting. They're gone before we know it. The new car doesn't satisfy because six months from now you see another one and you want another one, and you still want that feeling of having a new car, and it's telling us a lesson. These things do not satisfy. But in this case, the lure is a plot promise of pleasure, and there may be pleasure in sin, but there's a hook. And just like when the fish bites on the lure and is hooked, he is pulled out of the water. And folks, when we're pulled out of the water, we're pulled out of the living water that Jesus gave us. And when you're a fish and you're pulled out of the living water, you die. And sin kills me. James 1 and verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It struck me this morning that when Moses was fully grown, he gave up the pleasures of sin. But sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. 
my desires, my lust have pulled me away from God. How? The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Why? Because lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And we are told, what? Exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. Why? That none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Wasn't the lure deceitful? Didn't it promise pleasure? Didn't it say it will make me happy? And then I found out it had a hook in it. Judah had every privilege that God could give it. And we learn in Jeremiah 17, verse 1, that the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart. Why did it take a pen of iron and a diamond point to write down their sin? Did you notice that it says it's written on the tablet? of their heart. The tablet, the law, was written on stone. And what had become of their heart? They had rebelled against God and they were worshiping Baal and they were worshiping the God of the Assyrians. They were erecting tent idols altars in the temple, and they were sacrificing their children in the valley of Molech. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their ashram, beside every green tree and on the high hills and on the mountains in the open country. Do you understand what is going on by the green tree and the high hills? They're worshiping the Asherim, a fertility goddess, in front of their children, and they are committing sexual immorality in the face of their children. That's how hard their hearts had become. And for that, God says, Your wealth and all your treasures I will give as spoil for the, as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. Premeditated sin hardens my heart. Premeditated sin gives me a heart of stone and is why the prophet Ezekiel said that Judah needed a new heart and a new spirit. My sin leads me into the wilderness to die. Jeremiah 17, verse 5, Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness and in uninhabited salt land. There's a picture there, folks. The picture is, what happened to Israel when they refused to enter the promised land? When they openly rebelled against God and said it would be better for us to die in the wilderness than to have, or to go back to Egypt. 
Do you see that their unbelief was a sin that led them to further rebellion? And they died in the wilderness. They lived in an uninhabited salt land. When one travels from Jerusalem down the slope to the Dead Sea, the first thing you notice is the absence of people. Nothing lives down there. Do you think that picture was in their mind when Jeremiah said this? Why am I in that wilderness? Jeremiah tells us in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Do you remember what God said about putting tassels on your garment? In Numbers 15, verse 39, And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. My heart has proven to be untrustworthy. We're following our heart when we say, I know God wants me to be happy. We're following our heart when we fall for the postmodern thought of my truth. God is not mocked. He knows our motivation. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. That's Old Testament, Byron. Is it? Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight. Notice what it says next. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. We are the man without clothes. We think we know that we can hide from God what's in our heart, but we can not. God knows the heart, says that a heart hardened by sin will prevent repentance. We like to argue about this passage and what it covers, but I want you to keep in mind that if sin hardens the heart, then it is impossible. In the case of those who once have been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Judah was guilty of premeditated sin. The prophet Jeremiah was sent to them to bring them to repentance and not one turn back to God. Not one. Why is that? The prophet Ezekiel said it's because their hearts were hard. They once knew the law. They once had a relationship with God. 
Do we think that if our hearts are hard, it will be any different for us? Folks, I have set across from someone who used to attend here who told me flat out that she wanted to be happy and she was sure that God would be happy, make her happy. And she refused to repent. Is her heart hardened by sin? Why? I want you to think about something else. The writer says, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt, what about the Pharisees? What about the Jewish rulers who crucified Christ? Was it because they did not know the law? They did know it. And what did they do? in rebellion against God. They crucified the Son of God to their own harm. He came to seek and save the lost in Israel, and what happened? They put Him on a cross and held Him up to contempt. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that when your heart is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, and you refuse to repent and you rebel against God, you are crucifying the Son of God again to your own harm, and you are lifting Him back up on the cross for contempt. And what happens when Christians don't live the way they're supposed to? What do we hear when we try to teach our neighbors and friends, oh, I know people like that. They do not live the way that they preach. Ring true? But here's what you need to remember. You do not want to rebel against God. You do not want your heart hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You do not want to get to the place where it's impossible to bring you to repentance because Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. And folks, if God knows our motivation, His judgment is just. Deliberate, premeditated sin is rebellion against God. If I persist in that sin, my heart will be hardened. And I will no longer listen to the Word of God. I know you know this. Few people ever say, I will not listen to God. I've heard a few. But most don't say it like that. They say, I know God wants me to be happy. Others may say, I am following my truth. And one I've heard a lot, the Holy Spirit has led my heart to do this. These excuses reflect a heart hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. But I want you to remember this morning that sin is deceitful. It always promises something it will never deliver, and it will deliver something it did not promise. The wages of sin is death. The prophet Ezekiel told us that God, it does not take pleasure in the death of anyone, and that's why he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, that we could be saved from sin, not from hell, that we could be saved from sin. And Jesus gave His life on the cross and shed His blood so that we could be made holy to be as holy as God is. And He calls you. He says... Be saved from this perverse and crooked generation. 
And what does He tell you to do? To repent. Repent of sin. Make up your mind that I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm going to live for God. And confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And then put Him on in baptism for the remission of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what I'm really worried about, I'm worried about it in myself. Are our hearts hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? Is there something I'm harboring because I believe it's what God wants for me when that is contrary to His Word? If you are having that problem, please come forward as together we stand and sing so that we can pray for you and that you can make the changes you need to make. Won't you do that as together we stand and sing?